morning again. If you've got your Bibles, you might open them to 1 Thessalonians 5. It'll be our main text for today, although we are going to be jumping around quite a bit. Uh, if you've got your bulletins, you can probably already tell that. How many of you know what a thing is? A thing. Okay, so we're a little confused on what things are. Um, let me try this a different way. How many of you have ever said something like this? Hey, go over there and bring me that thing. You know what I'm saying? Okay, more of you. Or how many of you have ever said to maybe one of your kids or, or a friend or your spouse, like, um, hey, run out to the garage and grab that thing. Now we're getting there. Now we're getting somewhere, right? You know what I'm talking about? Or, or maybe you said, hey, go over there to the shed and get that, that thingamadoodle or that thingamabob, right? Now you know what I'm talking about, the thing, right? We're all on the same page. You know what a, a thing is? It always reminds me of that song that it's not a worship song. Uh, it's not a spiritual song. It's not a song you're going to hear the band do anytime soon, I don't think. But uh, it comes from that, that great, wonderful classic, The Little Mermaid. <laughs> yes, y'all know the song? I'm talking about, I'm not going to sing it for you. The words are on the screen. If you want to sing it, feel free. She begins by saying, look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? Wouldn't you think my collection's complete? Wouldn't you think I'm the... I'm not a girl, so I'm not going to say that. The girl who has everything... Look at this trove, treasures untold. How many wonders can one cavern hold? Look around here, you'd think, sure, she's got everything. And then she says this, I've got gadgets and gizmos aplenty. I've got who's it's and what's it's galore. You want, here it is, thingamabobs? How many she got? 20, 20 that's right. And then she says, but who cares? No big deal. She wants more. If that doesn't sum up our culture, when it comes to things and stuff and gidgets and gasmos and who's it's and what's it's and thingamabobs, then I don't know what does. We all have lots of things, don't we? You probably couldn't even count all the things in your life. Things are more than physical, though. Things are more than just stuff. It's more than material possessions. In fact, I looked up the word thing in the dictionary. It was described this way in one. It says, a thing is an object that one need not, cannot, or does not wish to give a specific name to. That's pretty vague. So basically, a thing can be anything, right? Anything can be a thing. So today and next time we gather, we're going to talk a few uh, about a few of the many things we should be thankful for. We're not going to get to everything, but we're going to talk about a few of the things we should be thankful for. In my opinion, this is really the biggest blessing of committing to doing eight weeks through the gratitude journey, um, working through it. It gives you an opportunity to be disciplined about being thankful for all the things in your life. As I've said multiple times, you don't have to buy the book to do this. You can do it yourself. Just take some time in the morning and the evening to be thankful and to go on a journey on your own. The book is a good help. It's a guide that helps you focus on the things in your life you should be thankful for. But even if you don't use the gratitude journal as your guide, I would strongly encourage you to set aside a number of weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, whatever you want to do in your own life, to be disciplined daily about being thankful for all of the things you have to be thankful for. We know we should be thankful. Our main text for today comes from 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse 16, where the apostle says this, he says, Rejoice always, pray constantly, and give thanks in everything. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. To the church in Ephesus, Paul wrote something strikingly similar, just in a different way. In Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 17 through 21, he says, So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. 
And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. And then he says this in verse 20, giving thanks always for everything to God. The Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. So when it comes to thanksgiving and gratitude, I think the thing that we are probably all missing the most is just the opportunity to do it or being disciplined enough to do it. I want you to remember three simple little words today. It's our big idea. If you want to fill it in the blanks in your bulletin, it's this. It's a simple concept. Everything means everything. Everything means everything. So I want to talk about a few of the things we should be thankful for because everything means everything, doesn't it? The first thing you should be thankful for are small things. Small things. I think in general it's easier for most of us to be thankful for the big things in life. It's the small things that we tend to overlook. We're, we're naturally pretty inclined to be thankful for the big stuff in our life. Um, for example, you've, you're probably thankful for your house, aren't you? Or your apartment or wherever you live. Especially on a cold, rainy day or a hot summer day. You're thankful for that, that place you can go to after a long, hard day's worth of work. A place of refuge, a place that's yours, a place that has all of your things. A place where you can be comfortable. It's It's easy, quite easy to be thankful for your house, but what about all the small things that really make your home a home worthy of being thankful for? Like, how many times have you been thankful for your toilet? That's something you visit a couple of times a day, I hope, probably in your own house. But how many times have you been there just saying, hey man, I'm so thankful for this toilet, Lord? It's a little thing, like it's a small thing that makes a bigger thing more special. As somebody who's had the privilege to travel the world and be in many countries where they don't have toilets, I can tell you, you spend a few weeks there without a toilet, you'll be thankful for it next time you need it, right? It's a small thing, but we should be thankful for it. Or how many times have you been thankful for the blankets that are on your bed that keep you warm at night? Your house, your home is full of these small things, these little things that make up this bigger thing that you're overall grateful and thankful for. Another big thing that I think most of us are are naturally inclined to be thankful for would be something like the sunset or the sunrise. When you see a beautiful sunrise or a beautiful sunset, it's easy to look up at that and, and be thankful, be thankful for God and his power, to be thankful for the blessing of being able to enjoy that, to just to just sit there for a moment and just say, wow, man, God and his creation is incredible. Isn't that easy? It's easy to be thankful for that. It's natural to be thankful for that. But how many times have you looked at a a sunrise or a sunset and thanked the Lord for your eyesight and the ability to be able to see it? You see, that's a small thing that we often overlook, but that small thing is what enables us to enjoy the big thing. And we're rarely, if ever, thankful for that small thing. And you might be saying, well, preacher, you're getting pretty picky here. Like, golly, you want me to be thankful for everything? Well, yeah, because everything means everything. And it's not that small of a thing. If you think it's a small thing, if you think it's a picky thing, maybe you should ask one or any of the 43 million people on our planet who are blind who cannot enjoy a sunrise or a sunset. They would tell you that little thing in your life is a blessing you should indeed be thankful for. When I was putting the gratitude journey together, I wanted to make sure to give you many opportunities to dare you to be thankful for the small things in your life, the little things, the easily forgotten things, the missed things. Because when we can be thankful in those small things, we develop this this little muscle inside of our heart and inside of our spirit that helps us to really appreciate the big things even more. After all, everything means everything, even the small things. The psalmist said this in Psalm 92, verse 1. He says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, Most High. 
You see, we give thanks for all things, even the small, simple things, simply because it is good to give thanks to the Lord, and everything means everything. If you go to Philippians 1, Paul gives thanks for something that seems like such a small thing, but he was very, very thankful for it. Look at Philippians 1 with me, starting in verse 3. Paul says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer. He was thankful, church, for his memories of this place. He was thankful for the memories he had of these people. He was thankful for the memories of Philippi, even though all of those memories were not good memories. He was just thankful that he had the memories of them. When was the last time you were thankful for your memories? Thankful for the memories of your childhood. Thankful for the the memories of your children's childhood. Thankful for the memories of days gone by. Thankful for the ability to even remember them at all because some people can no longer even remember, can they? You see, being thankful in the small things makes a big difference in our life. And when the Bible tells us to be thankful in everything, well, everything means everything. Even and especially the small things. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Starting in verse 15, Paul says this. He says, this is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. Paul's giving thanks as he remembers them. He was thankful for their faith. He was thankful for the way that they loved people. And he was thankful that he had a memory of them. Have you been thankful for something like that? Just this week, I took time in my own dedicated, disciplined time of Thanksgiving to make a list of all the people in my life that I have memories of. Great memories and in-between memories and even some that I have bad memories of, but I was just thankful that I had the memory to remember the lesson that I learned from those people. (laughs) Just saying, Lord, I want to be thankful for all things. But I made a list, and many people on my list were were people of big faith and big love. People who didn't necessarily love me or show their faith to me, but just people I've witnessed in life and have memories of them doing great things. Some of them have gone on to be with the Lord. Some of them are still with us. Some of them I haven't talked to in a really, really long time, but I was grateful and thankful for the memories of them. Being thankful for these small, easily missed things will impact your life because everything means everything. Let me share this one last example with you from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 16. Again, the Apostle Paul says, Thanks be to God who put the same concern for you into the heart of Titus. That seems like such a small thing to be thankful to God for, doesn't it? The context here is the church had taken up an offering to send to Jerusalem. And Paul was thankful that God had put the spirit of a caring and concerned heart inside of a man named Titus. He was just thankful that Titus shared the concern. That seems like such a small thing, like such an obvious thing, like such a little thing that could easily be overlooked. It seems like a thing that doesn't even really belong inside of the Bible. And yet when the Spirit of God was pinning this holy book for us, that small thing was put in there. And I believe part of the purpose in that was to remind us that everything means everything. So church, here's my challenge for you this week. I'm going to challenge you this week to be thankful for the small things. I want to challenge you to think and pray in a way that gets you down into the cracks and the crannies and the nooks of life. Take the time to slow down and pause and be thankful for as many of the small things as you can possibly remember and be thankful for. The second thing I would encourage you to be thankful for are significant things. The Bible tells us we're not just to be thankful for the small things, we're also to be thankful for the significant things, the big things, because everything means everything. 
We don't just see people in the Bible teaching us to be thankful for small things. They also teach us to be thankful for significant things. Small things, significant things, and all things in between are things we should be thankful for because everything means everything. So what do I mean by significant things? Well, let's look at some examples in Scripture. The psalmist said this in Psalm 107, verse 1, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. That's a significant thing. And then he says this, His faithful love endures forever. That, my friends, is two significant things in one powerful verse. Just this one example, we see these two significant things, that the Lord is good and that the Lord would love you and the Lord would love me enough to be faithful to us. And it doesn't say he's faithful for a day, a week. It doesn't say he's faithful for a month or for a year or for a generation. It says his love endures forever and ever and ever and ever. How thankful should we be for that significant thing? That He will not leave you, He will not forsake you, He will not abandon you, He will not forget you, He will not fail you, He will not ditch you, He will not disown you. How thankful should we be that when He saves you, when He forgives you, when He adopts you, that that is a forever thing, a significant thing, a special thing, and something that we should be thankful for. Everything means everything. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 9, 15. He said, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Talking about Jesus Christ, our Savior. Say amen if Jesus is something significant we should be thankful for. Say amen if Jesus is a significant thing. Of course he is. We should be thankful. From the smallest thing to the most significant thing, our thanksgiving should ring out across creation because everything means everything. Here's one more example of a significant thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 56 and 57. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a significant thing that we should be thankful for, that we should be grateful for. Do you acknowledge and do you appreciate every day the great victory that your salvation is and the fact that it was brought to you by Jesus Christ through the blood of Christ? It's a big thing, a significant thing that we should be grateful for because everything means everything. All right, I feel like you guys are tracking with me. Seems like you agree, right? We should be thankful for the small things, amen? Amen. Yeah, we should be thankful for the significant things, amen? Amen. You're probably thinking, man, he's going easy on us today, especially after last week. Well, we had not got to point number three yet. Save that one for last today. I promise you the devil doesn't want you to understand this last one. He doesn't want you to believe this last one. He doesn't want you to be thankful for this last one. But if you'll stay with me and just consider it, I promise you this can transform and change your life because everything really does mean everything. The third thing, the last thing we'll talk about today, we'll pick this up again when we're together again, but the third and final thing I would encourage you to be thankful for is suffering things. Suffering things. Church, please hear me. I... I don't want to suffer. I'll be honest with you. There's no reason to lie. I'm a big baby. <laughs> I'm a big old baby when it comes to suffering. I, you know, I'd, I'd like for you to believe that I'm real big and tough, but if you just go talk to Abby, she'll let you know I'm not. <laughs> so I might as well be truthful with you. I don't get sick a whole lot. I don't get sick often. But when I am sick, I'm a big baby. Because I don't like to suffer. Ladies, how many of your men are big babies? Say amen. 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 Oh, they're calling y'all out. (laughs) Calling you out. It's not just me. A lot of big babies in the room. And all of us. None of us want to suffer though, right? And when I suffer, I'm not very quick to be thankful for it. 
When you suffer, are you quick to be grateful and thankful? Most of us aren't. I don't know many people who are quick to jump to thankfulness and gratefulness when they're going through a time of suffering. But everything means everything, even suffering. We should be thankful even there. When we're suffering, the last thing on our mind is thanksgiving, but it should be the first thing on our mind and on our hearts because everything means everything. Look with me, if you will, into Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 6. Paul gives some sound and solid advice here. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, he says, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I looked up the word in Greek here for the word everything. Do you know what it means? I looked it up for all the other everythings we've read in all of our texts so far as well. Do you know what it means in Greek? It means everything. <laughs> because everything means everything. It means all. It means the whole. It means the sum or the total of it can mean every kind or every variety, but the bottom line is it just means everything. So everything means everything. And you will have suffering in this world. When Paul penned those words to the Philippians, he was suffering. Paul had a lot of suffering in his ministry, a lot of suffering in his day. He certainly had a lot of suffering in that period of his life when he was penning those words. You will have suffering in this world, I can promise you that. Suffering comes in a lot of different varieties. It comes in a lot of different shapes. It comes in a lot of different forms. There are physical sufferings, of course. There are emotional sufferings. There's relational suffering in our lives. There's mental suffering in our lives. There can even be social suffering in our lives. But no matter what, if you live long enough, or maybe I should rephrase that and say, if you live for any amount of time at all, you will suffer. I know that to be true. You want to know how? Because Jesus is not a liar. And Jesus said these words in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus is not a liar. This is what Jesus says. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And then he says, you will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. So if Jesus says you will have suffering, the reality is, is no matter how hard you try to avoid it, no matter how fast you try to run away from it, no matter how, how many things you do in your life to prevent suffering from coming your way, you will have suffering in this world. We live in a world that has fallen, a world that has been corrupted by sin, so suffering is going to happen. So if that is true, if Jesus isn't a liar, then we need to learn to be courageous enough and strong enough and disciplined enough and faithful enough and submissive enough and spiritually mature enough to be thankful for and grateful even in our suffering because everything means everything. Let me offer you some hope and some encouragement from those who've gone before us in the matter of suffering. You're not the first one to suffer. You're not the only one to suffer. Many have gone before us in the matter of suffering. And somehow they found a way not just to endure it, but to be grateful for it. Look at Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 3. And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions, he says. We're boasting in our affliction. We're boasting in our suffering. Why? Because we know that affliction or suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. And this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. In other words, he said, even in our suffering, even in our afflictions, there's something good to be thankful for. There's something good to be hopeful for. He says, in my affliction, I see the goodness of God. 
Because even in my suffering, there is something positive being produced in my life, namely endurance, which leads to character, and character, which ultimately, he says, leads to hope. And not just any hope, but a hope that will not disappoint us. You know, I don't think Paul wanted to suffer any more than I do. I don't think Paul wanted to suffer any more than you do. I I really sincerely doubt... And I don't know because I've never gotten to talk to him. But I really sincerely doubt there was any day in Paul's life where he woke up and said, you know what? I think today I want to suffer. It would just be awesome today if I could just suffer greatly. Nobody wants to suffer. He didn't seek suffering out. He didn't want to suffer. But even when he did suffer, he was able to be thankful for it. Because you know what? Everything means everything. Romans 8, 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. Paul wrote that too. The sufferings of this present time is not worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed You know, if there's one thing we're really good at as humans, it's comparing, isn't it? We compare things all the time. We can't get through life without comparing things, whether you're comparing gas prices to find out where you want to fill up or whether you're comparing something at work to decide which way you want to go. It's a critical skill to survive in this world, to be able to compare. But the kind of comparing I'm referring to is is a different kind of comparing. And, and typically, when we're suffering, that's when we compare ourselves the most. And we start comparing ourselves to other people. That's why we ask questions like, why did this happen to me? Because it didn't happen to them. Why do I have the cancer? Because they don't. Why was my spouse or my child taken because theirs wasn't why did I get passed over again for that promotion I worked so hard for because I'm way more qualified than he is or she is we're good at comparing ourselves to others why is my house so small I work just as hard as they do why can't I ever get ahead to buy a new vehicle Why am I back here in coach next to this screaming baby that's throwing up all over everything? And they're up there in first class, ordering off of a menu and drinking their wine. We're good at comparing, particularly when we are in desperate moments of suffering, aren't we? Paul had the same opportunity, but he didn't compare himself to others. He compared his suffering, not to the lives of other people that seem better than his. We never see Paul say, why am I in prison? They're not. Why did I get shipwrecked? They didn't. Why are they hunting me and making me run for my life when they're not after that guy? No, Paul says, yeah, I'm comparing to something, but I'm comparing to glory. And he says, you know what? My present afflictions, my present problems, my present suffering, really when I compare it to glory is nothing. And so I'm grateful and thankful. You know what happens when we compare ourselves to other people? You, you, you know this to be true. When you compare your life to someone else's life or when you compare uh, your wealth to someone else's wealth or when you compare your status to someone else's status, or when you compare yourself to anyone else for any reason about anything, it doesn't make you more grateful. It never makes you more grateful. It makes you more hateful, is what it makes you. It makes you mad. It makes you frustrated. It makes you concerned. So next time you're tempted to compare, why don't you compare it with glory, like Paul did? then I think you will find that everything means everything and you can be thankful even in your suffering. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says this. He says, Therefore we do not give up, even though our outer person is being destroyed. Our inner person is being renewed day by day. And then he says this in verse 17. Catch this, church. He says, For our momentary 
light affliction. Now, if we had time to talk about the light affliction he's talking about this morning, you would know um, he's playing it down a little bit here. His affliction is, is a lot heavier than any affliction any of us have ever faced. But he says our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we don't focus on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You see, the point again is that everything means everything. Paul says, even though all this stuff is going on around me, and yeah, even though I could compare myself to everybody, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to waste my time or my energy or my effort on that kind of thing. No, I'm looking at glory. I'm looking at eternity. And I can be thankful because I know what to compare things to. James wasn't messing around when he said this in James chapter 1, verse 2. He said, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. What is he talking about? This guy done lost his mind, y'all. I mean, when you read that as a normal person, you got to go, you know what? This guy's been on more than a gratitude journey. Like, he, he is out of his ever-loving mind. He said, consider it great joy. I'm with him. I can do this. Whenever you experience various trials, no, sir, I'm out. When I'm experiencing trials and sufferings, I, wanna, I want you to know I'm suffering. Right? I, I want you to feel sorry for me while I'm suffering. I want you to, 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 to have to come to my rescue and my aid because I'm suffering. No, he says, no, you consider it joy, brothers and sisters, because everything means everything. I'm not saying this is easy. I'm just saying it's possible. I'm not saying this is natural and you're ever just going to naturally be, you know what, today was a day of great suffering, so I have a lot to be thankful for. I, I don't know that that ever comes natural to anybody, but I am telling you it's possible because we see it in our brothers and sisters who have gone before us. I'm not saying it's going to be painless, but I am saying it is possible. In church, we got to learn to be thankful and grateful in our suffering. We've got to learn this discipline. We have got to embrace it. Because all of us who follow Christ will suffer. And I'm afraid that our suffering is going to increase in the years to come. And if we're not ready for that, if we're not prepared to handle that, if we are comparing that to other things, the wrong things when the time comes, well, we're not going to suffer faithfully, are we? And we're not going to suffer well. If you think it's going to get easier for believers, even here in America, over the next 2 to 10 years, or 10 to 20 years, or 20 to 40 years, you're wrong. It's only going to get tougher, and our suffering is only going to increase. We must not forget or ignore scriptures like this one in Philippians 1, 29-30. Which says, for it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him. Again, you're with me to that point, right? You believe in Jesus. Many of you have believed in Christ. You've called on him as your Lord and Savior. This is a wonderful thing. Best decision you could ever make in your life. But here the Apostle Paul says, it's been granted to you not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. Not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Let that sink in for a minute. Let that settle in your heart. And make a decision and decide right now that you know what? You're going to be thankful in everything because everything means everything. Everything. And that even if suffering should be the thing that is in your path, even if suffering should be the thing that wrecks your day, even if suffering should be the thing that you face the most from this point forward, you will still be grateful and you will still be thankful in everything because everything means everything. 
And because you want to have a faith that is so strong that it doesn't just believe in Jesus for your salvation, but it believes in Jesus in the midst of your suffering as well. I want to have a faith that's so strong and a love for Christ that's so strong and so deep and so bold that I might respond like those in Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 40, it says this, After they called in the apostles and had them flogged, in case you don't know what, it doesn't say had them fogged, it says had them flogged. That's where you get beaten. Bad. Tied up and beaten. Not like a fair fist fight. Let's see who comes out on top. This is suffering. This is torture. They beat them. They, They, you know, Pastor Pete's version would say they beat the snot out of them, okay? They ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they released them. And I want you to look at what verse 41 says. Because they have just exited this moment of great suffering, this moment of great pain. They are carrying their bruises on their skin. Blood is dripping out of their flesh. And verse 41 says, Then they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin, griping and complaining and comparing themselves No, it doesn't say that, does it? They went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin rejoicing. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. In the midst of their suffering, they are rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for Jesus. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 24 Paul says now I rejoice in my suffering for you. I rejoice in my suffering. And again Paul's suffering was true suffering. It was great suffering. It wasn't about, like the suffering we see on social media from Christians today who went to H-E-B and they were out of avocados so they couldn't make their guacamole for their chips that night for the game. That's not great suffering. (laughs) We're not talking about the suffering that, you know, you you couldn't afford Bluebell, so you had to get Blue Bunny. That's That's not the kind of suffering we're talking about. This is legitimate, true suffering. And he says, I rejoice in it. Because everything means everything. I want to have a testimony like that. I want to have a testimony like the psalmist. Psalms chapter 30, verses 11 and 12. You turn my lament into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with gladness so that I can sing to you and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. Again, in the midst of his suffering, he's grateful and he's thankful. Because everything means everything. Even our suffering, especially in our suffering, everything means everything. As we close our time together today, can I remind you of what Jesus said on the night he was betrayed by Judas for 30 pieces of silver, knowing it was going to happen? Not just a night he was let down by one disciple, but on the same night, he would be abandoned by almost all the rest as well. Before the rooster crowed, Jesus would deny him, uh, Peter would deny him three times, though Peter said, I'm willing to go with you unto death. As he reclined at the table in Luke's gospel, chapter 22, verse 14, he said this, when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him And then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. His suffering would include the cross. His suffering would include a beating that was so torturous and so barbaric, his own mother couldn't identify him. His suffering would include him being stripped of all of his clothing before they tacked him to the cross and raised his bloody body there, high on Calvary. And yet Jesus rejoiced and was thankful that he got to have one more meal with these guys who were going to let him down. He 
He fervently desired to have this time before he suffered. Jesus shows us that we should be thankful for everything because everything means everything. He suffered for you. He suffered for me. He died for you. He died for me. He conquered the grave for you. And he conquered the grave for me. You can accept his free gift of grace or you can deny it and reject it. You can accept his love and his grace or you can deny it or reject it. But you cannot deny and you cannot get away from what he did for you. His suffering might seem like a small thing to you. Or maybe it seems like a significant thing or an in-between thing. But I promise you this, it is the most important thing. Because the Bible says that no man can come to God other than through Jesus. That there's no other name under heaven by which men or women can be saved. Jesus himself said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So whether you see Jesus as a small thing or a significant thing or some kind of in-between thing, I promise you he's the most important thing. When it comes to your eternity, there is no eternity worth having outside of Jesus. He lived for you. He died for you. He conquered the grave for you. And he invites you to accept his grace, to accept his love, to accept eternity, and to become a member of his family. What a beautiful, wonderful thing. Let's pray. If you're here this hour and have never given your life to Christ, never called on Him as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to do that right now. If you can hear my voice, if you're listening on the radio, we invite you to do the same. Just pray with me in the stillness of your heart. If that's you, say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up. I know that I've gone astray. And so I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I ask that you would make me new, that you would make me holy. I ask by faith that you would forgive me. And Lord, I thank you for dying for me. Father, we come before you concluding our time here in your word and we are grateful for it. We're grateful for all the small things that we have forgotten to be thankful for. We're grateful for all the significant things that we foolishly are rarely thankful for as well. And Lord, we're even grateful and thankful for the suffering things of our life because the reality is, is in the midst of those suffering things, we are often the closest to you. Those are the things that bring us the hope. Those are the things where we see you the most. So Lord, I pray that you would give us a heart and a posture for thanksgiving in all things, small things, significant things, suffering things, and all things in between. Lord, that we would be grateful and thankful for everything. Father, help us to take this challenge this week, to take this gratitude journey to focus on it and be disciplined in it so we can be transformed by it. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen.